everybody, it's uh, a- Anime Club. We're back. Yeah. M- more Great Pretender. Talking. This is uh, the most episodes at a time that we've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, d- I really was not expecting that last arc to be nine whole episodes. Yeah. Oh, the, yeah. That was the weird. Thing about, the thing about Wizard of Far East is that it's uh, it's kind of two cases. It's like, a, it's, it's, like a, it's like a case and a half. Yeah. Because you're dealing with the same people, but now it's just ten years later. And you and you have to and you know and Laurent has to basically uh, re scam them, <laughs> or it has to do it again. Right, it's um, it's a lot. Uh, but we'll talk about that one uh, after we do the little short adventure with Cynthia because that one came first. Yeah, that was real um, short. Yeah, four episodes. Snow of London is good. I actually really liked. I actually really liked Snow of London. It was a very like. It was sweet. Yeah, it was. It was like a much more personal, like even more personal story than the uh, than the skies of Singapore, which right. was interesting considering that it was an episode shorter. <laughs> right. I like that. Ah, oh, shoot! What the? You know? Hold on. I took. I have notes this time. I have a note. Ah, shit! You're the complete opposite of me. I didn't take notes this time. <laughs> The uh, uh the um flashback scenes in Snow of London always make me emotional. You know, in general I think that whole little arc made me got me that little that whole little arc got me. Uh-huh. Uh but uh I appreciate that they were like, Yeah, we don't know what to make fine art look like, so the majority of the air quotes fine art was uh just kind of blurry shapes. Except yeah. Except for the focal point of the show. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think they still use, like, real, like, artists, like, of the past and all that to, like, try to drive the point home a little bit. But uh, I do like how they kind of went with mostly, like, nondescript paintings just to kind of, so it's more in the set of the theme rather than making the the portraits, like... Other than the other than the the portrait itself, the the snow of London, like the focal point. Yeah, it does help with that too. It keeps you focused on the one thing. I also like that this um, uh, this antagonist was uh, actually does have uh, a personal connection with one of the thieves. Right. It's it's just funny because once again Makoto goes with a half baked half ass baked plan and they think it's gonna go, you know, pretty smooth until Cynthia actually catches them and she's like, oh shit, can't go, we can't fool this guy. I hate to admit it, but this guy is actually like legit. <laughs> um, fun <laughs> fun fact for uh, my viewing, um, the version that I was watching, uh. Again, subtitle problems. None of the French was subtitled, uh, and the like Vietnamese um, sushi chefs were subtitled in Vietnamese. <laughs> really, I didn't get that. Yeah, it was it was really weird. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I didn't like get there that. were no subtitles except for the Vietnamese guys, which was subtitled in Vietnamese. <laughs> Where do you? What were you watching? Now, were you watching it on PC, mobile? Um, yeah, I was. Because uh, I I was watching I was, mine entirely I was, on my phone. So, right. Well, I was not watching on Netflix. Uh well, there you go. <laughs> the version that I was watching um fell off the back of a truck. Hmm. Weird. Every time I think about going back into Netflix, I think about what they have to offer, and then I kind of forget about them. Yeah. It's not a lot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I also haven't fully looked at the, the log uh, since I made a new account to watch this show. Like, I literally have only been wa- I've literally only been using my Netflix to watch this show. 
and I haven't actually looked at their whole catalog now, <laughs> other than uh, other than I know that they probably still have all of their other Netflix produced anime like Devil Man Cry Baby and all that, which I highly recommend if you haven't watched it. It's actually really good. Me. Not really sure. Like like I said, I kind of like I binged this whole thing. So like the whole like all of the episodes are kind of like a soup in my brain. So I'm trying to remember uh-huh. everything. <laughs> I thought you were gonna you're gonna watch it throughout the throughout the two weeks. And I uh, lied. <laughs> wow. I had a similar experience. <laughs> <laughs> also fell asleep in the middle, so I might have missed some stuff. <laughs> oh no. Like I like I woke up, realized I slept through some of it, and didn't know exactly where I fell asleep. So I kind of just winged it, pulled it back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I said, "Okay, I, I I think this one." <laughs> so, I, you know, I'm glad. I'm glad that at the end of Snow of London, like Farah doesn't get fucked over by the scam. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, because she's she wasn't uh, she wasn't terrible. she was yeah she wasn't really a bad person. <laughs> I'm surprised that art dude had that much money just laying around because it hadn't really been like I guess it was kind of established with the whole ex boyfriend that makes uh, counterfeit art thing that he might have some money from finding the counterfeit art and running the auction thing. But I didn't think he'd have like, what was it, a hundred fucking million he spent? Yeah, well, well I, he, I imagine I imagine it might be like a an Elon Musk buying Twitter situation where he like took on a bunch of debt by le- leveraging a bunch of assets, and then like now he can't pay it back. Yeah, it sucks to be that guy. <laughs> I mean, he sucks to begin with, so because he because he was expecting to get paid back by Farah, and she fucking dumped his ass. Rightfully I'm glad so. that they they got her to wise up. She was not mm-hmm. wising up up until she heard that recording. Yeah, and she had she had the blinders on. Yeah, and that's and you know that's a fairly that's still fairly realistic for some people. They just either you know you know rose tinted glasses and all that i've been in and seen people in those relationships wouldn't recommend no i don't think anybody would <laughs> and i do like that like the the group definitely uh saw through that to that as well like they actually were able to like see Farah and be like yeah this dude's just taking advantage of your money and we're not going to try and steal your money we're just going to steal his money Right. <laughs> they kind of leave it up in the air, but it's implied at the end that uh, what Laron mm-hmm. uh-huh. may have set the whole thing up in the first place to get uh, Makoto interested in doing that. Right. Well, it's it's also implied in uh, in the final case that Laurent was setting everything up because it was all part of the same con. Yeah, like, I think they even, like, said specifically, like, every single one of those cases was, like, a testing ground for Makoto right. for, the fi- for the actual final gig that he was going to try and pull off, which was his revenge gig. Right. And that, and you know, and that included, you know, re- you know, and it all started with the fact that he found out that, you know, his old partner had a son, you know, his dad. And it just so happened, and I think it was kind of more in, I think there was still a bit more of, like, in the coincidence in that sense that, like, Makoto also just ended up being, like, a scam artist. But then, because I don't, because there was, I don't think there was any way for uh, his father to to know that his son was also becoming a scam artist. But the fact that he the, that uh Laurent just ran into him by chance and saw that you know he's you know a very inexperienced version of his father that made him think like hey he can maybe I can actually uh maybe this kid is just as talented as his father so maybe we can bring him along 
another useful target. Laurent is definitely not a good person. <laughs> no. Which is also kind of funny. He's be- definitely like going going all in for this one act of revenge. Well, I think it's really funny though because when you go into like when you go into that penultimate episode where, you know, Makoto hijacks the heist for a hot minute, he does call them out on their hypocrisy. Right. On, on how like they always tell him, you screw up, we're going to dump you. And yet, you, you look at the context of the entire show, that has never once happened. They always come back for each other. And and he does, you know, rightfully call them out on the fact that, like, especially Laurent, like, you're doing all this just because your partner got killed by these people, and yet you can always keep saying, you know, you screw up, you we dump you. So what the hell was all this for? Especially like at his dad, who's like, "Why are you doing this when you left me and mom to go to go on this crusade against your old partner or to to avenge your old partner?" Which I mean, I know it's also being played up for the fact that Makoto just wanted to have control of the situation for once to make everybody sweat for a minute, even though it is. It, and I think that's kind of where I had my one issue with the ending was the fact that even though Makoto did have, like, this one moment of catharsis, like, even though it was ev- eventually still going to be, be part of the end plan, Laurent still saw through it. And I think that's what made me a little upset because I think that was the whole intent for Makoto was, like, just to make him sweat for once. And I, th- and, I, and I think he did for, like, one split second until Laurent did see the blood pack in his jacket, which he realized that, okay, no, he's actually just playing this up even if... Even if he is speaking from the heart, he is just playing this up. Right. He's got uh, that eye that Pegasus had in friggin' Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> <laughs> which, I mean, I, I feel like that's... Which I think kind of made me, yeah, not... I didn't hate the ending, but I definitely felt a little disappointed by it because of that whole situation. Because Makoto, you know, hijacking the heist at the end of it, just for like a brief minute just to shout at everybody didn't really like serve really any point that i saw considering that he that he still went along with their plan anyway like right like it still went off without a hitch like just the fact that he just wanted to just make him sweat a little bit for what point it didn't really it didn't really seem to really go anywhere like laurent still got his revenge you know and uh Makoto's dad got some bit of closure with his son even though his son still doesn't really want to do anything with him at the moment and you know and the team and I think maybe throwing it back in the face of the team probably helped a little bit more because I think everybody else was a little fooled for a hot minute like I think Abby both Abby and uh uh Cynthia did like mention like real briefly like for like a split for like one moment they thought that he was actually gonna go through with betraying them all but they also know how makoto is because he is still ultimately a good kid a good person right and that he would actually never really go through with that but the fact that he was able to at least throw their hypocrisy back in their face made it at least i think it was at least a little poignant even though i don't i felt like it didn't really land as much because it didn't really seem to affect anybody so some parts of the ending kind of fall flat i i think i think the the whole reveal uh at the end of like the second to last episode that the entire building was fake <laughs> <laughs> that was wild that was very uh very looney tunes but i honestly yeah. i kind of thought it was pretty i thought it was pretty funny <laughs> but uh i think I, of the of it's friggin' uh, the Emperor going, oh yeah, the Death Star, that's just the cardboard cutout. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I could, you know, the thing it was is that I could buy the fake building, personally. What I didn't really care for was the fact that he, they managed to bring back the the three previous antagonists yeah. that, didn't, that didn't really serve any purpose, other than maybe Kasano. Right. Like, Kasano, at least, like, being, like, the kind of guy who'd be like, yeah, you know, you screwed me over, I once screwed you over, we're even now, whatever. 
you know, I can do you a favor. The other two, right. like he, the like, other two, really, like he, like they, they just came back for the sake of coming back. Yeah, and it's just like, like it's Col- like Coleman and America. Abraham, like they, 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 they ruined their reputations. Right, Cassano had at least like you know, you know, typical American gangster shit could come back like from anything. Right, yeah. and but their like, shoes, fuck that guy. I wouldn't have been there. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like fucking, especially Sam. Oh yeah, definitely. Like the they they. <laughs> that guy never yeah. had much going for him in the first place. I mean, I thought yeah, it was like, funny. Like in the beginning of the case, like they actually brought back Clark for a split second, which was nice, right? And they even and, make and it Clark. Dig it. Clark has the the best reason to be there because like he was he was never really that invested in the business of the air race to begin with he just liked to race yeah. so he would he would have like the least hard feelings out of all of them yeah and then and and I like that in that episode they actually did take a take a swipe at 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 Sam when he pretended to be him for a hot minute just to just to show the child traffickers you know, like right. the proof of the uh, the lost uh, princess or whatever. <laughs> yeah, the, like I, I I'm very mixed on that ending because like you could definitely tell that that like Makoto was like having like a very like weird like surrogate mother moment with the with the yakuza lady. Yeah, and it's like it actually kind of seemed pretty genuine for a moment. <laughs> yeah. And she's that, and I mean, she seemed to be pretty genuine about it, which I feel like was probably a very precarious situation with Makoto, considering he has very, very bad parent issues. I mean, everybody in this series has <laughs> has some kind of issues, yes. But yeah, well, most of most of the like four main cast, three out of four have fucking parent issues. Yeah. <laughs> I can identify with that, <laughs> but so uh, it did. And I mean, like, and they were setting it up to being like, oh, like with the with the other main assistant to the to the yakuza lady, you know, he kept co- kept calling Makoto, like, you know, like he she's gonna make you the 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 next leader of the company. You remind her of her son. You you're actually basically his the same age as him and all that. And it's like, hmm. And I would and I would say like for a brief moment at that penultimate episode where Makoto hijacks the heist for a minute, I actually kind of believed it for a second. Yeah, I'm like, oh, he actually got he got fully yakuza pilled. All right, <laughs> he's going in on it. <laughs> they did a pretty good job there, yeah. But I think the I think what did actually you know make me realize that oh, this definitely is an act is the fact that. Ozaki, his father, did actually end up killing him, even like you know, quote unquote, slashing at him. And I'm like mm-hmm. thinking, like Ozaki would never, like his oh, dad, yeah. his dad would never. There's no fucking way. Uh, I like that at the end they they kind of like reveal that all of the kids that got sold actually were being sold to them. Yeah. That was a, that was a nice little like addition to be like just just so we didn't have that just, question yeah. of like where did those kids that uh, Makoto was selling to yeah. <laughs> going just just so that we didn't have like oh uh yeah, you know Ma- Makoto gets to gets to redeem himself but he still sh- sold children into slavery <laughs> and then it's like okay no he actually was just selling them to his friends okay right. <laughs> It was, not it was not not pretend. like in the way of like actually selling them selling them but you know right I mean? so that that so that at the very least you know he did get to live that gangster life for a minute yeah I mean then again he's lived that gangster life twice actually <laughs> I think I, now I think back to the first case yeah being a drug dealer is definitely an interesting path for him yeah drug creator. <laughs> I actually have also, to look, I actually have to look at like the timeline of this series because I'm actually like, trying to remember like how long has it been since that first case up until the very end. Uh, so I know he spent like at least like a year or two like in prison after the first case. They mention mm. it's been a few months when they go from the case with the painting to the next to the start of the next one. I, I yeah, would... I think 
I, I think it's have... like four years, something like that. So it's over the course of like, like three or four years. Yeah. Oh, it says so that that seems about right. Like none of the characters really seem to like visibly age, which is obviously you know just to keep on character with the model. But like the only ones who really did seem to change were Abby and Makoto, who and Makoto, who both got like haircuts at some point. Yeah, <laughs> they had a decent time span in there. Wasn't some so crazy like, shit like, hey, the world's ending and we got to solve this problem in four days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This one, it's like, I, I like I like how they do kind of give it some space to breathe to actually like feel like like an actual like like what these people would do in not necessarily what they would do in between heists, but like, you know, them getting back together after after doing a heist. It's like maybe it has been like maybe only like a couple of weeks or maybe like a year or two. Oh, speak. Uh, speaking of it, there being time between things in the beginning of uh the uh the the snow the 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 painting episodes uh that yeah, little art there yeah snow in london or the whatever uh when he's trying to work for those vietnamese sushi chefs uh-huh. I, w- I was sitting here thinking i'm like god damn it is laurent doing this again is this part of a fucking scam is he learning to be a sushi chef for a specific reason I was on edge for that. <laughs> they're gonna. I mean, I think after they're the gonna second, make him do sushi for a fucking. I mean, when you when you put him in the long con to making him a mechanic for an airplane after the second case, you have to just assume that anything that Makoto is doing, it's probably Laurent like guiding. The, guiding yeah. <laughs> I mean, even the fucking the with the last case, uh, like that was such a weird long con. For him to be like to him to be like basically subliminally like message like hey go work for this specific company that yeah. I'm trying to get you to infiltrate for me and it's like I think that is probably one of the most frustrating parts about Laurent in that and and they bring it and it's just you know it's the fact that they bring up so often is that he just doesn't like fully trust Makoto to just go with the plan like, right he just has to just trick him into doing everything. And I, I also think it's just part of Laurent as a person. Like, he kind of... he He's just, like, a serial gaslighter. He's good at it. That's the main problem. I mean, when you, when you are, you know, as physically charming as he is and know, like, eight languages, you might as well learn how to gaslight people. <laughs> well, yeah, and he's been conning people for a the better part of his life so at least the last at least yeah like the last like half of his life because he's like in his 40s right out here on the playground like no that's actually my ice cream cone you ate yours (laughs) (laughs) uh did anybody notice at at the beginning of the the last case um when laurent wakes up from his dream uh there's the the blankets are tented. Yeah, I did notice. He was uh he was having a he was having a kind of a dream, a uh, a fun one. Yeah, he for was, some he was, pitch, he was pitching a tent. For some reason, and I don't remember why, I was I was on like because I was I was looking to see what people thought a little bit about that about the uh, the snow in London bit. And uh-huh. then I saw someone mention, like they were they were kind of like thirsty for Laurent, and I was like, I wanted to see under that sheet. It's like, what the <laughs> hell are they talking about? And then I got to see, I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the uh, that is a a wild choice. Yep. <laughs> it's like there's. There's also uh, that scene in Shrek that people bring up sometimes. Oh yeah, with like Farquaad <laughs> apparently has a boner. Yes, where where Farquaad gets a boner. <laughs> oh my god! One thing like, that I actually was why like, why did oh. you include this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing I was actually really impressed by was at least with the english dub i don't know if the original run ever did this was how many languages they actually did include in this 
Yeah. Like... Because, like, they they translate all the Japanese into English. Mm-hmm. And but, then, and then, of course, with the snow in London, there were lots of bits that were being spoken in French. That was pretty impressive. And then, like, with uh, Wizard of Far East, like half of that is in is in Chinese. Yeah, it's crazy. Like how much? Like I actually had to like actually look at the TV or I, I look at my phone to actually see what they were saying because there was just so much Chinese being thrown. Around. I'm like, oh shit! I actually don't know <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was pretty wild. Yeah, I don't think I've seen another anime that has the diversity of languages that this one has. Yeah. And I think that's and I think that's probably like a benefit to at least with Netflix because right. I don't because probably who knows, maybe not so much as in like it's it's entirely in the budget, but maybe they just had a a pool of voice actors that they can pull from that actually know multiple languages obviously you know voice actors that are up and coming now are becoming a lot more high profile because they know extra languages right i the the one thing that i'm wondering about though is if laurent if laurent's voice actor was actually speaking chinese or if they got a different voice actor who sounded like him because it sounds like a different person <laughs> I wouldn't put it past when he's they speaking did. Chinese. I mean, there was. Uh, I'd like to think that maybe he tried because there was that one moment where when they went to Kyoto, and he was trying to hit on those two Japanese women, and he was speaking Japanese, right? And it, that was clearly his voice actor, right? So maybe there. Were, I I would like to. I'd like to think that he at least attempted to try to do the Chinese, but if they did, just get a better per just get a person that was fluent just to make just to sell the fact that laurent can speak Chi fluent chinese mm -hmm. then you know i'm not particularly bothered by it right it, you know and i'm not entirely sure which i prefer anyway because there was a thing with old dubs where uh or not old dubs old subs and stuff where you would hear the people japanese people try to speak english that they clearly hadn't learned. They were just reading to the best of their ability a script, and it just sounds hilarious. <laughs> so that might be... Well, I mean, I'm most, here, like, most Japanese people learn a little bit of English yeah. in school. Yeah, but... But it's... <laughs> it's it's sort of like hilariousness yeah. versus... Like, what, what are we aiming here for? But if it's right. competence, even if they did get a different guy for it, I kind of... I'd be fine if it's it does sound a little different but when you speak a different language and you are fluent at it you do sound different because there's a whole nother accent to it that changes how right. you speak like I've, I've noticed that with uh, well, Spanish it, it, a lot. and especially and especially in Chinese where like inflection is everything oh yeah like you know you know how I learned that even was when I was working security years and years ago there was a guy who spoke Chinese and English and probably some other language I can't remember, but he was explaining to me that, oh yeah, there's, this is two different words. There's ma and there's ma, and then it, and that was two different words. I forgot what he said, what each one was, mm -hmm. but that just the ma, like the the different inflection there, different word, and that's all it was. Yeah, right. my dad. My dad went through a similar situation because uh, he uh, he. Uh, my my dad's Mormon, and he uh, he went on a mission to Taiwan when he was in his twenties, and uh, yeah, he had to learn. Uh, I can't remember if he learned Cantonese or Mandarin, but whichever one they speak over there. But um, but yeah, he he literally said the same thing, where it's like he struggled, like you know, he eventually learned a little bit, but like he did struggle in his basic pronunciations because inflection was basically everything. Yeah. And yeah, so, I, I learned it because my uh, sister was learning Chinese in high school. I saw, I was in um, West Seattle not too long ago mm -hmm. at, at a uh, QFC, and there was a uh, sign on the wall that had a, uh, like a phone number. It was like, hey, come here to learn, get, get your Chinese lessons and whatnot here, learn how to speak and write. Uh, proficiently and I was like huh I can't say I didn't I wasn't interested because 
I was just like, that just sounds neat. But at the same time, I remembered the inflection thing. I was like, okay, that might, I don't know, that might be beyond me. Right. Thank Unless God I, I'm a, <laughs> thank God I'm a weeb, and I decided that Japanese was the language I wanted to learn at initially because at least it's a very phonetic language that doesn't require too much on inflections. Yeah, uh, I I uh, think uh, I think um, it's it's interesting to learn like the the history of Japanese because they definitely like kind of made it to be easier than chinese oh yeah like the whole like i don't because because it was originally like a an offshoot of chinese and mm-hmm. they they made it a lot easier and then they made uh katakana to increase literacy rates oh no because uh, it, was, it was a first. lot or yeah but yeah, like, and then katakana came along a little afterward to use for like, uh, for borrowed words. Right. That was mainly for, uh, for the, uh, like the European traders. Uh huh. For the most part, but yeah, then yeah, they just simplified their own language. But the only thing that makes me ups- not upset, but just something annoyed about when I was trying to learn Japanese was the fact that they still try to u- they still use kanji, which uh-huh. are which are just ca- which are simplified Chinese characters. Well, no, they're they're full on Chinese characters, but like simplified for Japanese context, and multi and like in any other language or whatever, multiple con- kanji, one kanji can mean multiple different things in yep. different settings, and it's very annoying. <laughs> well, that's that's where you get a lot of the um, like Japanese people being like, "Oh, this is how my name is spelled," mm-hmm. because oh. it it has like. It can have different connotations depending on how the name is spelled, and I think I yeah. saw a bit of that explained in Zom One Hundred when they were talking. He was they were teaching the main character, or the girl was showing the main character, like, "No, if you have this line here, it means that, and if you don't have this line here, it means comp- something completely different." That sounds like we want to eat people. No, that was Heavenly Delusion. Uh-huh. That's what that was. Uh huh. Oh, okay. Heavenly Delusion was that. Okay. Yeah. Get my animes mixed up. <laughs> uh anyway we went off on a tangent again well yeah i mean i mean language is just, i mean language was like was kind of a consistent theme throughout great Britain. right yeah short version accent fine if changes perfectly bilingual people do have a complete accent change new mexican guy right. when he spoke spanish wouldn't have known he could speak english when he spoke english i wouldn't have known he could speak spanish <laughs> mm-hmm I think one of the funniest things about that about this whole last arc when it came to languages was the fact that the the Shanghai dude, uh, Lue, mm-hmm. just like he's been working for the Yakuza for like upward to like over a decade and has never once picked up any Japanese. And so the fact that they were having this But Zoom he's been call, learning English recently. <laughs> yeah. But the fact that they had this Zoom call with essentially his boss and he just does not pick up anything that she's saying, and so it was just easy for Makoto and and Laurent to just just completely bullshit them and just be like, "Yeah, he said this," and uh, "Oh, she said this." It's just like yeah, the fact that they were able to get to, <laughs> able to get them to just agree to just deposit a shitload of money from either side without question is so funny. <laughs> I think he would have picked up some of that their cultural osmosis or something but no. exactly like it's like your your organization has been under this yakuza you know boss for who for who knows how long and the and and on the other side you know you this yakuza lady has been in charge of the you know has been at least been in contact with these guys from shanghai for over a decade at the very least you think that either side should have picked up at least a little bit of the either one's language, and yet they just chose not to. Yeah, it's it's so goofy, and it's but it, it's, but it's I can also weird. See, but I can also kind of see it as being kind of in character, considering who these characters are. Like you have the yakuza lady, you know, a Japanese woman, an older Japanese woman who you know when we look at, you know, IRL context of Japanese people tend to be pretty xenophobic around other people. So they just don't 
learn of they just don't learn anything about other cultures right. and then you have the context of Lue, who is just so you know is so high up on his high horse of his successful operation in shanghai and wants to separate from the yakuza so badly that he's just willing to just to disregard everything that they want or say so it's just like i don't give a shit about these people i don't care that i work for them technically Right. I'm, I, I'm just going to go through seven different interpreters instead because I don't want to have to deal with them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it it seems it, it feels like it would be sort of like a a power play kind of thing where they're like, "Oh, yeah, I don't respect you enough to learn your language. I'm going to like have somebody interpret for me instead." <laughs> Which is so funny because when you when we first meet Louis, or not necessarily when we first meet him, but like when he's having that one conversation with his right hand man about the importance, uh, or like you know the importance, or at least the context of translation, like because he brought up the 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 uh, the the example of those two Japanese authors, you know, one became more famous than the other one, and it's just because of depending on the interpretation of one's translation of the work, and it's like the man is like does not see the irony in in the in his own words and it's like you 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 think that words are so important but your but your interpretation of that is that you need the most perfect translator instead of just learning the language yourself right it's got to cause some uh liability issues when you have a third guy in there that's translating everything as well Exactly, like it would have been. Well, that's been, what happened. Yep. <laughs> exactly, and that it would it actually would have been the even opposite better of a better power play to being like, yeah, I actually know Chinese, or in the context of the Japanese lady, I I actually or yeah, like I know Chinese, I know you're bullshitting me, but right. you know, then then the plan wouldn't have worked. It's like right. those people listening in on other people's conversations, and they end up talking shit, and then they're like, hey, I speak that language. Fuck you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like I, it's just so funny that the whole plan hinged on both respective leaders, just ignorance of each other <laughs> and contempt for one another. That they were just like, man, these two were actually like they might be brilliant criminals, but they're also kind of stupid. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think I think that's kind of a running theme of the the show is that like these these people are really successful at what they do, but that success has kind of blinded them to their own failings. Yeah. And their own, like, weaknesses that Mm. could be exploited against them. It's kind of weird in some cases because they didn't really... Like the art guy, he didn't really have the expertise to begin with. He just faked it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think he had some kind of like actual skill, but the fact he but he just had such a massive ego in the sense that he was the best. Uh, what's it called? The uh, what's his profession again? The uh, curi- not curi- uh, not curator. Uh, art. well, he's an art dealer. He is an art dealer, but he's like the examiner but appara- guy. Examiner, whatever you want to call it. Art appraiser. Appraiser, that's That's what I was looking for. Yep. Like, he had to have at least some credibility to his skill to at least recognize a fake from a real one. I mean, that's how he's able to spot talent for people who can make fakes. Right. Mm -hmm. So, like, this guy obviously did have skill and, you know, an appreciation for art, but it, it got so twisted because he thought that, you know, because he has this particular skill and love for the arts that he thinks he's better than everybody else so and so he just interprets that as like any person who thinks that they can do what i do they are inferior like that's why he was getting so heated at the at the auction that laurent was hosting because you know, he was able to appraise what he thought each of these pieces were and then you know he was all the, the prices were completely overinflated oh yeah. yeah i think like the first one alone was like he like he like he just saw it and it was like that's probably worth like 30 grand and then the first bid was like i think either the first bid from the crowd was like 100 grand or Laurent no laurent laurent started the bidding at 100 <laughs> yeah that's what i thought which is, i mean it's also very which is also a really good tactic obviously to get the 
get the dude off of his you know off his game because now he's just getting now he's surrounded by so so many uncivilized people that now he's just like he's not thinking straight and that's why he was able to go into that buyer's high when you know when snow and london came around which was re- which was honestly yeah a really good tactic yeah do you the think fa- all of the the people at the underground auction were uh like in laurent's pocket or do you think some of them just came there to actually be at an auction <laughs> with the think... amount of people that were at that the end of the first heist with the with the uh with the with the gang oh with or... like the yeah. gang and the fbi and all that yeah. stuff i i i Definitely. could i could assume yeah. i mean you also remember <laughs> that he also had that same crew help build the fake building right in the last case too so i could imagine that yeah he probably hired all those people just to be you know, fake gangsters and shit like that. Yeah, it's confidence. Which family. I mean, cle- it's it's clever. It's great, and I think like, I mean, he did the same. I mean, they used the same tactic for uh for the Singapore crew too. I think all of the, I think all of the uh, the the gamblers in the the underground yeah in the underground room that they were hosting in their hotel room were all his people too. Right. That, that's why they were able to scamper out of there so easily. Man, what a great fucking job that would be to be a background extra in a ten million dollar scam. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you, and you could probably walk away with at least like like a couple like a couple couple thousand bands. Yeah, yeah. I would love that fucking job. <laughs> yeah, it's like, hey, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna scam this dude out of ten million. Uh, you you, you know, put in the- you put in like fucking twenty minutes of work. And it's like you could walk, and you could probably walk away with like and 10 walk to away like, with like like ten twenty five k, yeah, <laughs> couple thou just. <laughs> I mean that's why uh, what's his name Coda or Kodo was mm-hmm. able to just go in like on all of these plans because that's just literally how he made his living. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. But just they like, also just never seemed to have money afterward. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible with money. I mean, all of them were. I think the only yeah. person who actually had any financial literacy was Cynthia, and that's the only, because she has that private house on a on a fucking island. Yeah, <laughs> kind of funny because I mean, like you even saw that uh, that lifestyle being kind of presented even from a decade ago with when Dorothy came or when Dorothy was in the picture. Mm-hmm. Like she was almost the exact same. Like I mean, she was the one who kind of started the whole the whole. Maybe not the whole gang entirely, because I mean, some, obviously, someone had to teach her too. But because we only have the the point of view from Laurent learning everything from Dorothy, you know, you can at least have like a starting point of where this gang got its values and how they operate, which is also kind of ironic in that sense because Dorothy is the one who kept also was the one who had the mantra of, "If you screw up, we dump you." But she and it seemed like she was the only one who actually lived to that, but she only hold her she only held herself accountable. Right. When you know, when she took the bullet uh on you know when when they got caught the first time. Also I I just speaking of disappointments from the last episode, the post credit scene. Mm-hmm. I, was wondering I don't think we that. needed that. <laughs> No, I I don't I, think so. I think it was kind of yeah the, the apparently it kind the, it kind of like almost ruins Laurent's character arc a little bit and apparently the uh, I didn't read too much into it but apparently the uh, the O N A that follows over the original net animation that follows the series mm-hmm. basically goes off uh, from that point like it's tar- it's apparently entirely uh, focused on Dorothy. Okay. I don't know. I haven't seen it. Uh, I don't know. I don't know any information about the uh, the follow up. Considering, yeah. Because I want to know. I want to. I at least want because because since it was an original net animation and not, I don't know if like the same people worked on it. I don't know if the director is the same, if the art style, or even if Studio Wit is still the same. Because if it's an original net animation, which means it was published on the internet first. Who knows if Studio Wit was even like still part of it? I'm sure they were. I I just I'd have to look it up, and you also have to look for it if you don't want to watch it on Crunchyroll because apparently that's where it went instead of Netflix for some reason. 
Anime, yeah, that's wild. Anime licensing is such garbage. It's just everywhere. Yeah. I can only hope that Crunchyroll also got Great Pretender at some point, or will at some point, because because the the follow up actually came it's, out la- this it's year. It's not. It's not on Crunchyroll. Wow. Uh, yeah. It's so weird because I and, I have a Crunchyroll account and it's it's not there, or else I would have watched it on Crunchyroll. Well. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Apparently that's where the follow up is, and it and it's very recent too. I think I, I think when I read it, the last episode, like I think there was four, there's four episodes, and the last one aired like early this year, like in Jan- like January, February. I mean, it's so wild that you'll get things like half a season, or you'll get two seasons out of six on one platform, and then get the rest of them on another one. I know. It is yeah. whack. It's it's so weird. Like I'm pretty sure that's uh there was a, there was definitely an anime I went to watch that had that issue where they just had oh, that's what it was. Uh I don't remember the anime, but it, I I uh went to watch it and I wanted to watch the dub. They only had the uh-huh. sub on Crunchyroll and the dub was on a different platform that you had to pay money for as well. Huh. Yeah. I think I uh, I I think I've had a similar situation. It could have been a point. Funimation thing back when they were still That also separate. would have been an issue because That's yeah. Been a problem, yeah. Because yeah, when Funimation had their partnership with Crunchyroll and then that eventually ended and I think Sony got involved at some point as well. And so now it's just it's kind of a kind of a yeah. weird licensing mess between those three because I think Funimation. Well, Crunchy Crunchyroll uh, eventually acquired Funimation. Yeah. And so now, all of the Funimation stuff is on Crunchyroll. Just so weird to think about. <laughs> yeah. Considering you know Funimation has been ar- had been around for at least over two decades at this point. Oh yeah, so much longer than than Crunchyroll had been around. <laughs> I can only hope that now, because they acquired Funimation, perhaps their fucking streaming uh has got has gotten uh, has gotten better, because apparently the the old Crunchyroll UI and their streaming practices were just garbage. <laughs> it's like it's not it's not that much better, but it's better. Uh. Well, I guess for the people who exclusively go on Crunchyroll, they'll probably be like, "Yeah, we take those." <laughs> I'll just find um, some obscure bullshit on Tubi and watch that. <laughs> but yeah, uh final thoughts. I still think it I still think even though I was a little disappointed by the end, I still think it was a good show. Yeah. Very definitely. solid. Very solid. I still love the uh the art style and the color palette. Mm-hmm. Character designs are solid still. Oh yeah, the the environment work is amazing. Very good. Like I still I still think uh Skies of Singapore is probably the best arc considering yeah. that it does that one feels like a genuine like heist. Like the yeah. first one was a good way to like introduce these characters and kind of under kind of get like the flow of how the story's going to go. So it's a very solid arc. And then and then you know, you got Snow of London which is still a very good arc but it's a very slow and very personal one despite being mm-hmm. a lo- being the shortest one you know it gives a lot of great character work to Cynthia which you know she was my personal favorite character to begin with mm-hmm. so oh, it was really nice to see and then and then unfortunately in the the last arc she just kind of like disappears for most of it yeah and then I would say like there was a lot of great as there were a lot of great factors that went into Wizard of Far East. I do like how they did try to they did basically tie in like a case and a half because they wanted to settle the score from a decade from a from a failed from a failed uh case from a decade ago, which I still think was really great for Laurent. Like I still I think it was overall still a solid arc, especially for Laurent because we yeah because we finally got to understand like why he is the way he is and how he operates i still kind of think it's it's a little weird that we had to have like 
because the the first episode or the first case that I forgot the name of um is is kind of like Makoto's backstory case mm-hmm. and then we have to we have to have him share another backstory case with Wizard of Far East because his dad's involved in that one I mean I guess you can argue that it's not not completely Makoto's backstory case and it's more of Ozaki's right. it's just right. the fact that because Ozaki is his father you know you know, it it just it's just kind of connected with it, and you know, and because Makoto is still technically the protagonist of the series, he does tend to get a little bit more of a focus for it. But overall, I do think the show is still very solid. You know, I, I don't think know. it's fun that the uh, that the last episode starts the same way that the first episode starts. Yeah, I actually completely forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. Because it's got it's got the uh, the first episode starts with Makoto hanging from the Hollywood sign shouting help, and then the the last episode starts with the Yakuza guy sitting on the on the beach on, and he's on the beach out help. screaming help. I, I like I like little I like callbacks like that in media in, yeah in media like that. You know when when a story can wrap in on itself in in a in a good way to like kind of like bring back its themes and or even just call back to earlier stuff that's when you know like the writer i feel like that's when a writer really knows how to like it shows intentional tie, tie writing yeah. yeah so that's uh that's gonna be the end here i hope you had fun i know i did yeah we will definitely have you on as a guest uh at a later point but uh the next anime that we're going into is the second half of the first season of dungeon meshi and we're bringing back orion for that one so that is a series i definitely want to watch on my own time anyway so (laughs) yeah you definitely should i i know i've (laughs) <laughs> I, I I have Twitter. I I it's all it's all I ever <laughs> see other than Fear Red, which is another series I want to watch. So yep, <laughs> it's all over Tumblr too. Senshi number one dead. Woo. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, that's uh that's gonna be our next one. Uh, not even my where type, can, by the way. Where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on mainly on Twitch right now. Uh, because I don't have uh, I I I I'd, I'd like to keep my Twitter personal until I make a a one for a, a second one. Uh, you can find me at twitch.tv forward slash Loomis TBK. Uh, I don't have a set stream schedule yet because uh, my life is a mess at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, that's where I'm trying to be at. Um, I will maybe by the time I'm on here again, I'll actually have a secondary Twitter to uh, to to push as well. Yeah. All right. Chris, you still don't have anything? I have a series of random numbers and letters pointing to a cardinal direction and a uh, di- and a coordinate located in South America. That <laughs> is the name of an Instagram that I created. <laughs> good luck all right, <laughs> all right everybody lear, lear, uh, relearn your longitude and latitudes <laughs> <laughs> gotta gotta solve an ARG to find Chris's Instagram <laughs> uh, and you know this is my channel <laughs> we're here baby we're here we're here. You're already there's, here. There's links. There's links to a Patreon and a um, Discord in the description. And if you're suffering in 85 degrees inside of an apartment, I am sorry for you, but I am with you. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Uh, that's it. Bye bye. Bye bye. Just.